A through KE. Uh, we have Ms. Chase who, who couldn't make it tonight. She had a family emergency. Emergency. She is KF through O. Uh, Mr. Jesse Luna is on screen. He is P through SA. And Mrs. Kathy Marin is also here, SB through Z. Um, so just so you know the way it works, we are responsible most likely for all four years, your, your student will be uh, a Del Norte Nighthawk. Uh, and then we have two guidance technicians that we normally would be sitting outside of our offices. Uh, Mrs. Jamie Stone and Ms. Sue Reich. So some of you may have potentially communicated with them at some point and they're, they're kind of the, you know, so, sometimes the, the go-to people when it comes to some of those questions and, and they do a lot for us and we're, we're happy to have them. <clears throat> so some of the stuff we'll talk about tonight are kind of choices after high school. I know it's probably like, wow, we're, we're talking about life after high school and <laughs> the kids haven't even stepped on campus yet. So I know that might be seem, seem like a little far away, but I think as a parent, it goes a little bit faster than probably you would like in, in, in reality. So um, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about graduation requirements. We'll talk about college ent entrance requirements. You know, at Del Norte, we have you know, typically about 70% of our senior classes will, will go to a four-year college. So a lot of the, the focus does, um, does start there. <clears throat> Not for everybody, but it's definitely something that we, we tend to focus on. Four-year planner, which is definitely applicable for, for students that are currently in the ninth grade, because obviously there's still three more school years to go. High school course selection, we'll talk briefly about that and some of the supports that we offer as it comes to choosing classes for next year. Uh, strategies to do well in school. Obviously, things are different now in a pandemic and, and learning virtually. So um, we will talk a little bit about that and then talk about, you know, kind of what it would look like in person and then balance, how to kind of find balance with your schedule, with your life, with your, um, with all your activities. <clears throat> so high school graduation requirements, these um, you'll see many times. Uh, this is something that students, we, we give this presentation um, something similar to this presentation several times a year, and, and we obviously do it annually for, for each grade level as well. So these, these uh, graduation requirements have, have maintained um, the same for, for quite a while. So four years, 40 credits each, just so you know, each class is five credits. Um, if, if, you, if the student gets an A, B, C, or D, they will, will receive five credits. If they get an F, they won't, won't get any credits. So obviously passing grades are, are D or above. Uh, but we need 40 credits of English, <clears throat> 30 credits of social science. So uh, next year will be uh, the current ninth grade class's first opportunity to take a history class. Uh, science is 20 credits. So I'm sure many students are taking biology of the living earth right now, and they'll take either potentially chemistry or physics next year. Uh, math will continue on. Um, you know, it's 20 credits, but we, we really kind of suggest and recommend students continue math from start to finish. <clears throat> PE and health, so it's 20 credits of PE with an additional five credits of health. Uh, ENS 1 gives health credit, and then ENS 2, 3 will give it uh, five credits each of PE. So typically after a student has finished ninth grade and they've done ENS 1, 2, and 3, they'll need two additional trimesters of PE. Uh, fine art, foreign language, so that's five credits, one or the other. Um, not necessarily both, although most students will do both. Fine art is an ad additional five, five credits for fine art and then 85 credits for electives, which I think you look at that number, you, you see 85 and you think, wow, that's, that's quite a bit. <clears throat> uh, realistically, it, it's really not actually. Uh, anytime a student goes above and beyond the required credits. So for example, if a student takes a third year of math, those additional 10 credits will go towards elective credits. So it's that, that tends to add up pretty quickly. And, and by the time you get to, you know, close to your senior year, a lot of students have met those 85 requirements or elective requirements, I should say. So some post-secondary options that, that, that are out there and that, you know, pandemic, no pandemic will, won't really change. Um, what I would probably highlight though is, is work in a gap year. I think, you know, especially for, for students who graduated last year and maybe even are graduating this year is probably a little bit more common. Um, I think we're all hoping that it won't be that common when, when your, your student gets to their junior, senior year and things are a little bit more normal. Um, military is obviously an option, career and technical schools. So there, there are specific schools out there that, that specialize in, in career um, planning or, or career opportunities and, and also um, you know, certificate programs. And you can also 
get those through community college as well. The community colleges also offer uh, specific uh, programs like that. And then <clears throat> the biggest one that we'll talk about will be four-year university, whether that's public, private, in-state, out-of-state. Uh, statistically speaking, the bulk of our senior class typically will, e will end up at a, a, a Cal State or a UC. So most will, st will, will, will stay in state, um, but we'll kind of talk about different options and what that might mean. So California Community Colleges. So we, we want to start with this because community college, I think for, for many people in our community and many of our students and their families, they kind of, you know, it can be an afterthought, but I think it's really important to consider um, it as a, as a great option. You know, there, there are over a hundred throughout the state. I mean, just locally, there's, there's a bunch of different options. And I think that um, really the most you know, beneficial and, and the most um, thing that, that, that people would say is, is good to look at for community colleges is, is their requirements. Because we have a lot of students, yes, they do well in high school. They're very tuned in. They're very focused on their academics. They're very focused on their, their, their future. Um, but then we also have a, a small group of kids who, <clears throat> who I think mature at different levels and, and take maybe a little bit more time. I, I think looking back on, on a lot of the students that, that, were, that were my students that um, maybe didn't find their maturity or find their stride by the time they were, they were seniors and, and they've had to go to community college and you know, still staying in touch with a lot of them, they, they've made the most of it and, and gotten a fresh start. So I think something can, to consider um, obviously, I think as a school, we, we try to push and, and recommend students to go to a four-year college, but just understand that this is a really good option, um, whether or not a student, you know, gets into a four-year college or not, because I think there are different factors that play into it. So just locally, we've got Palomar, which is our, our kind of our feeder school, and, and we have a, a really, you know, pretty tight relationship with them. Um, at the moment, we have something called Pal the Palomar Promise, which is essentially free community college. So again, when you know when you go to apply to a four-year college and you see the bill and see the financial aid package and you compare it to something that's you know more or less free, you know sometimes that conversation tends to change a little bit. So um, you know just something to consider. And then you've got <clears throat> also locally, you know I would say distance-wise, actually probably closer is Miramar College. And that is part of a, um, the San Diego Community College District, which is Miramar Mesa College, which is down by Linda Vista, and then City College, which is downtown. And then there's also further south, <clears throat> there's Southwestern, which is in which is in Chula Vista, Grossmont, which is out in in El Cajon La Mesa area, and then Cuyamaca further east, and then Miracosta is is in Oceanside. So, you know, locally there's a lot of good options, and and as we as the students start to progress in their grades, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more specifically how that might impact um, you know, specific students in, in their situation. Community college. So again, I, I highlighted that there, there's very few requirements. Um, there really is no A through G requirement. And we'll, we'll talk a lot about A through G throughout this, this presentation and throughout the next three, four years. Um, there's no ACT or SAT score, so a student could could definitely avoid ever having to take that if they, they're afraid to um, or worried about it, but um, community college doesn't require it. And then again, like I talked about before, there's specialty programs, two-year degrees, um, and then what I would highlight as the most advantageous and the most beneficial thing that, that students can take advantage of would be the transfer programs. Um, just so you know, the, the California system is, is really set up to take a larger number of the students I was referring to before who maybe didn't get the GPA they were hoping to get or, or didn't, you know, didn't, didn't succeed at the level they, they were planning to. Um, transferring is, is a really, really good option for a lot of those students. Uh, one, it, it cuts down the cost and two, the chances of them getting into a school, you know, such as like a UCLA or, you know, maybe UCSD. Um, increase quite quite exponentially. So I just wanted to kind of really highlight that because that's one of the biggest advantages. And then while students are in high school, they can take community college. You know, I think, you know, now that we have an even closer relationship to Palomar in terms of proximity, the one in Rancho Bernardo, um, I think that's a really good opportunity for students to start to consider, um, you know, taking a class here. That Again, it's not for everybody, but I think for students who, who are really ambitious and want to try something different and new, um, it is a good opportunity. <clears throat> um, we have our, our registrar. Um, you would need to get permission prior to registering, but we do have a pretty smooth process when it comes to that. 
Okay, moving on to the four-year schools. So public universities, um, we're really just talking about the Cal States and the UC. So Cal States, uh, there's 23 campuses. Obviously the closest one, well, geographically to us is San Marcos, Cal State San Marcos. Then we have San Diego State as another you know, really good option. Uh, and then there's nine UC campuses. Obviously the closest one to us would be UC San Diego. Uh, and then there's a, a graduate studies in San Francisco. So really up and down the coast, we've got you know, really, really good public universities in this state. Okay, so some of the differences, because there are differences. There's definitely differences between, you know, obviously each school individually, but also each program. So the UCs, they, they, they have what's called the A through G requirements, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so anybody who's applying to a, a UC or Cal State needs to meet those requirements. Um, and then also making sure the grades are Cs or better. Um, if, if a student has a D or an F in, in an A through G class, that would be, need to be repeated. Um, there are some, some kind of specific differences between the UCs and the Cal States as far as repeating classes. I'm not, to, I'm not gonna get into the super specific details now because I think as ninth graders, there's other things that, are, that are, are, are a little bit more important at the moment. But what I would say is if a student does get a D or an F on their transcript throughout really any time in their, their high school lives, um, it would be strongly considered to, to repeat. <clears throat> and then up to eight trimesters of AP coursework receives an extra point. So really what that means is that they're, they're getting an extra uh, a point added to their, to their GPA. So there is a cap on it, obviously with eight trimesters. So <clears throat> some students will take, you know, 10 AP classes and, and they'll think, well, you know, my GPA should be higher than somebody who took less, but for the UCs and the Cal States, they do have a cap. It's not saying that those, that, that rigor isn't higher or harder. It's just saying in terms of the GPA, there's kind of a cap. Um, one thing I do want to highlight, which is which is really different than than what's ever been done before, is um, there's really no standardized test scores, at least through the, the fall of 2024. That could change. You know, I think the, the landscape of the college admission testing was already kind of a little bit flimsy and, and COVID really kind of accelerated that process in terms of um, what was going to happen with the SAT and ACT and how important is it going to be. So I think that um, that's something to keep, you know, keep, keep kind of watching, especially for us as counselors, because some of these things are going to change and some of these things um, are going to be, you know, still the same. So um, at the moment, <clears throat> the CSU still, they do, they do take the, the SAT um, or the ACT. The, and the, the difference between the two, I mean, right now the UCs are, are, are saying they're not taking scores, but it's still an option to send scores, but they, they normally will only take the highest sitting for a score. Whereas the Cal State, the, if you take two separate tests, you can actually combine the scores. So um, it doesn't have to be from the same test date. So again, this is kind of a work in progress. I wouldn't really take all of these, especially at least for the standardized test scores, the, the A through G requirements will remain the same. The repeat grades will remain the same. Um, I would imagine that the GPA stuff will remain the same, but the standardized test, the standardized test conversation is very fluid. So I think it's, it's possible that things could change, but just, just for your information for tonight. <clears throat> okay, so here's what kind of the, the consideration. So you, this is where you can kind of see that the bigger differences between what a UC considers and what a Cal State considers. So if we go through the, the, the list on the left here, the consideration for the UCs are obviously A through G coursework. <clears throat> right now the SAT, ACT is suspended, um, but the GPA from the A through G coursework taken after ninth grade. So that means really essentially 10th and 11th grade is, is really the bulk of the GPA that they're looking at. So Again, it's not to say, oh, ninth grade doesn't matter. You know, you can kind of do what you want and it doesn't really matter. That's not true. But when it comes to the GPA, they really focus on the 10th and 11th grade. And you can see the, 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 the kind of the top three things are the same. You've got the A through G course, coursework, SAT, ACT scores. Obviously for the, the CSU, they, they, they lean a little bit heavier on that than the UC does at the moment, obviously, because that's, you know, they have less data to work with. Um, but the, you still have the GPA from the A through G coursework. And then what the CSU does is they have an eligibility index where they take the SAT, ACT, and they calculate it with the GPA. And it's kind of a, 
a, an overall score. So it's very kind of mathematically based, if you will, and, and kind of easier to kind of, I guess, predict in terms of what a, a, a student's chances are for schools. Now, where the UCs really, you know, differentiate themselves are these kind of four bullet points I have on the left-hand side, personal insight questions. So, you know, maybe if you had an older sibling that applied to a UC, I don't know, maybe three, four years ago, that, that would have been called an essay potentially. Um, those questions have been changed a little bit to be a little, a little less of an essay type question and more of a um, opportunity for students to answer things that are, are a little bit more personal to them and a little bit more, um, you know, more of questions that are direct to them. So, um, and, and they have the choice to, to answer certain ones over other ones. Community service, obviously th that's something that we don't require as a school. So there's no certain number of hours, but is something to consider. Not everybody does it, not everybody has to do it, but I think, um, if students do it and if they do want to do it, my, my, my suggestion is always, you know, pick one or two things um, and do it as much as you can and, and give back as much as you can. You know, you don't need to do 15 different community service activities for 20 minutes. I think it, it'll show a little bit better if you pick one or two and you stick with it for a number of years. I think that's, that's usually the best way to go. Um, extracurricular activities, obviously, that's limited right now for our ninth graders. I mean, I, we still have clubs and they're meeting virtually and sports at some point will come back. Um, but those are something, some things that are important. And then I would say on top of that, you know, there's the leadership roles and awards received. So I think in every sport in every club in every opportunity, there's, there's usually a place to, to show leadership, whether or not it's, it's given or earned. I think that that's something that the UCs heavily, you know, look at and they, they like to see. Um, so again, you can kind of see there, there's some differences between the UCs and the Cal States. And I just kind of wanted to highlight that. Um, and then just note the CSU has additional considerations this year due to COVID-19. Again, I'm hoping that by the time your student is applying to college, we'll be back to the, you know, the quote unquote normal situation and, and, and um, we'll go from there. <clears throat> private schools. So again, really no different than public schools in terms of making a decision. I think it's important for students to, to know what the differences are in terms of what schools they're applying to and which ones they're not. So I think, you know, private schools have, you know, have a place for a lot of our students. Um, but I would also consider the, you know, the additional things that they ask for. So, you know, all schools have an application. The, the CSU and the UC is all self-reported. So it's really essentially up to the student to report everything that's being asked. Um, whereas the private schools, they're looking for other things that are not necessarily self-reported. Um, their letters of recommendation that come from the school, whether it's the counselor or the teacher or, or a combination of both, um, SAT or ACT, and then potentially additional high, sc high school coursework. So all private schools have different requirements, but they're all pretty similar in terms of the application and essay sometimes letter recommendation and usually a combination of an SAT or an ACT. Again, three years from now, will it be completely different? Probably not, but SAT, ACT is still that, that conversation that, um, you know, we'll see how that evolves. Okay, so here's where I'm gonna highlight the A through G requirements. <clears throat> On the left-hand side, I've kind of already talked about what the high school graduation requirements are. So really, I, I just wanna highlight the passing grade is a D or better. Uh, for the UC A through G requirements, the thing that I want to highlight before I get started is grades must be C's or better. So anytime there's a D or an F in the A through G requirements, that would need to be repeated um, to, you know, to validate that whatever that grade was. So social science, you've got two years, world history and U.S. history. At, at Del Norte, students will take, typically in 10th grade, they'll take either world history 1-2, or AP European history. 11th grade, they'll take US history or AP US history. And then in 12th grade, they'll take either civics and econ or AP government. So we, we typically meet that requirement with no problem. English, four years, really, which is the same as our, as our high school graduation requirement. The bigger differences really come here in math. So a student could conceivably graduate with just 20 credits, um, you know, which would be, you know, you could say math 1A, 1A 1B, 2A, 2B. 
but for to meet the, the A through G requirements, you're talking about three years. So the minimum is through three B. So again, that's, I would say is probably one of the bigger differences in terms of just graduating or being eligible to apply to a UC or Cal State. So finishing three B with a C or better is, is really the minimum requirement. And as you can see in parentheses, we have the recommended four plus. So most of the students are doing, you know, at least through three B, and, and, and hopefully beyond. Um, lab science, we've got two years, which is essentially the same as, as graduation. Um, so usually it's a combination of bio and chemistry or biochem and physics, or you know, sometimes working in some of the you know, project lead the way science courses, human body system, principles of biomed, medical interventions. I mean, we have really a, a great plethora of, of, of science offerings at Del Norte. And then foreign language to graduate high school, you could definitely easily not take a foreign language and still graduate. Um, some of our students do, many of our students do, um, but if you want to be eligible to apply to a four-year college, specifically a UC or Cal State, you would need to finish two years of the same language. So what that really works out to be is, is usually through Spanish 4 or Chinese 4. Those are the two offerings that we have at Del Norte. Um, some students will do, do other things you know, off campus that, that could potentially work, um, but most of our students will do, you know, through Spanish four, through Chinese four, where the recommendation is three years. So that would be through Spanish six or through Chinese six. And then one year of a visual performing art. So that would be one year of the same class. So ceramics, drawing and painting, um, photography, drama. I mean, we have a ton of options, 3D animation. I mean, there, there are a lot of options for students to take. Um, so whether or not they take all of those classes or a combination of those classes, they, they need to fit in one year of the, of the same class. Um, so that would be, you know, potentially ceramics one, two, or drama one, two, or drawing and painting one, two. And then they need an additional year of a college prep elective, which again, if they take a fourth year of a math or a third year of a science or a third year of a foreign language, they would automatically meet that college prep elective. And then we have a handful of other classes that also meet the college prep elective requirement as well. All right, college planning. So <clears throat> we're gonna talk a little bit about kind of the four-year planner and how that works into, you know, not only graduation, but planning ahead for, for you know, the rest of high school, but also beyond. Um, maintaining good grades and repair if needed. I would say if there's anything I can highlight about anything for college, that's it. It's maintaining good grades. I mean, when, it, when you break it down, you know, and you, you talk about students who get into certain places and why they got in, the students who get into the, the schools that they hope and they want to, it's because they've got they got the grades that that they that were essentially asked or that they they hope to get. So, um, you know, when it comes to it, whether or not we're talking about standardized testing or not, grades are still you know top of the table. Um, getting involved, you know, I think those that's a huge piece of it. You know, I think for some students, you know, they're naturally good at school and that's what they do. Um, and then you have students who maybe aren't, maybe they're better at, you know, some of those leadership activities, maybe they're, be, you know, maybe, maybe they're more athletic than they are uh, academic. So I think finding those, those avenues and those ways where you can kind of supplement your, <clears throat> your grades um, is also very important. And then community service, volunteer work, uh, there, there's a link to, to a list of clubs, which um, I know our ASB worked hard to kind of stay up to date and to work on those clubs and they're still going uh, again it's a different world virtually but they're still moving forward and, and, and kids are still connecting as much as they can um, and then the only thing i would really recommend as far as you know we get a lot of questions like oh you know we're, we're doing uh, volunteer hours where do we need to send that or what do we put that on and really the answer is is really whatever you want you know i think it's important to, to find your own system and find something that that works for you so i think um, there's no one right answer, but I would recommend um, at some point when you start to get in the grades, you start to get in the report cards, you start to get in the transcripts um, and awards and scholarships and programs and things, you know, that, that kids do, um, that you have some kind of a filing system and some, some organizational uh, piece to it. And then, again, you're still, students are really, you know, a couple years away from attending college fairs and visiting colleges. Um, especially during COVID. I mean, there's not really much to visit, but I think that, you know, summer would be potentially possibly a time to start to look at things. But I think 
you know, a year from now is, is a good, I think a really good thing to, to say, okay, you know, maybe next spring break, we'll, we'll take a trip to a group of colleges that we can potentially visit. So um, those are always really good options to, to get your, um, to get you out there. College planning continued. So again, standardized testing, I'm not going to get too much into that because it's such a kind of a, a fluid piece, but the PSAT, we offered it this year, not to ninth graders due to, due to COVID and just not being able to offer, you know, enough spots to, to accommodate those, those students. Uh, your student will be able to take it next year in the fall. We will most likely offer it on a Saturday in October. And then in 11th grade, that's where the opportunity comes for the National Merit Scholarship Program. So for students who score, uh, get a certain score and what's called an index score, they would potentially meet the requirement to, to apply for the National Merit Scholarship Program. Um, typically the ACT or SAT is taken in the 10th grade, or sorry, 11th grade. But again, I'm not gonna get too far into that because we don't know what things are gonna look like. Uh, SAT subjects, we wrote a thing of the past, they actually just, they cancel them. They don't exist anymore as of a week ago. So um, something that if, if you had an older sibling that maybe took one, um, yeah, they don't exist anymore. So one less thing to worry about. Um, and then also the College Board, which is the, the, the organization that runs the SAT, they also mentioned that they're not, there's going to be no writing section on the SAT. So it was, it was an optional piece. Um, that that students could take and and now it's 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 not part of it um the act still does have that as an option um but the sat actually the sat wasn't an option the act was an option but the sat they got rid of it so um it's just two portions now for your planner um we do have it on on our website it's it's really a good tool to i think for a lot of students to kind of plan out like what things could potentially look like the next year and the next year and the next year. So I think it's really something that, that you know, when, when families sit down and they start to ask questions to the, you know, with their students and say, oh, you know, what, what, what are you thinking about taking next year? It's really a good tool to start, not only start that conversation, but look at, okay, well, you know, this is how things will fit in and this is maybe how things might not fit in and how you have to kind of play with it and figure out, okay, how, how can I fit in the foreign language with the, you know, the visual pouring art and certain number of classes. So really that, that piece is important because then you start to consider like, okay, how many classes can you take? You know, how much can a student potentially handle? Um, obviously AP classes are, they take up three spots because they're all three trimesters. So how do those classes fit in? And then a lot of times what that does is it starts to, it starts the conversation of like, okay, you know, maybe I can only fit in this many classes for next year, and then I have to wait to take a certain class my junior year, and then, you know, I can only fit in so many my junior year, and then I can, you know, fit in certain classes your senior year. So I think it's an important tool to really start that conversation, and, and it's a good thing to, to work in pencil because I think it changes for a lot of students. I think it's, it's something that can be you know, you have an idea as a, as a freshman and then, you know, two years later, you know, there's certain classes that maybe you didn't want to take and now you do and vice versa. So I think it's a, it's a really good plan. Um, and then <clears throat> what we do is, and I'll get into this in a little bit, is we, we offer drop-in sessions for students to meet with us and not necessarily go through the four-year plan, but sometimes to talk about, you know, what do things potentially look like the next year and then how does that impact the, the, the year after that? So I think Again, it's important to, um, you know, to consider those things. This, just for your viewing pleasure, this is what it kind of looks like. The thing that I really like about it, <clears throat> I know it's a pretty simple document, but I, I think it's nice because it's, it gives you each trimester, it gives you five spaces for each, for each potential period in each class. And then you can see it, it also breaks down <clears throat> each English, each math, each world history by credit and also by A through G requirements. So it, it really shows you how you can meet the, the graduation requirements, the A through G requirements and how that fits into a, a four-year plan. And again, uh, for some students, they start the four-year plan their freshman year and they follow it verbatim from class to class. And then others, it changes completely. So pencil is something that, that we would recommend. Uh, NCAA, I'm, I'm not going to talk a ton about it, but the one thing I would say uh, for students who are looking to play a sport, I, I would say, you know, some of you as parents probably 
have an idea if, if your student athlete can play a sport. Um, but other others, you know, you might not be at that point yet. You know, it, it might be a little bit early to consider it. But what I would say is, is a lot of their requirements are similar to our A through G requirements. So for example, um, they have a core course requirement that you need to meet in order to be eligible. You know, again, it's, it's kind of an eligibility thing. And then the recruiting process is a whole different animal that, that we can obviously help with, but um, it's, it's, it's a different piece. So I'm just gonna briefly go through the differences between division one and two and then kind of how highlight a little bit how the division one core course requirement is very similar to the A through G requirement. So four years of English, three years of math, two years of science, one additional year of English. So that would be like if someone took a third year of a science or, or, a, or a fourth year of a math that would go into that category, two years of social science, and then four years of additional courses from any area above. So that's where sometimes things get a little bit tricky, you know, like the only courses that really count are English, math, science, um, <clears throat> languages, social science, and that's really about it. So for a lot of, and, and you can throw in like psychology in, in some of those classes, but most of the students that are, again, meeting the A through G requirements will most likely meet the division one 16 core course requirements. Um, and essentially it's, it's, it's almost the same for division two, except you, you take a year away from English, you take a year away from math, and then you, you, you really add three years of, of the other classes. So it's not, not as specific, but um, again, anytime a student starts to get involved in the recruiting process, we, we really like to know and we really like to try to help to make sure those requirements are being met. Okay, so again, there, you know, we're, we're highlighting this now. Um, you know, I would say in a virtual world, it's it's easier to get to these college fairs, um, and, and obviously quite a, quite a bit less expensive to having to travel. Um, so again, if you're curious about about looking at colleges and to seeing what's out there, I, I don't, you know, I don't, wouldn't necessarily say it's too early, um, but I think it's just more of an opportunity to see what's out there. You know, I don't think it's time to necessarily say, oh, you know, you know, my my student is. Is, 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 you know, tuned in on a, on one particular school. I mean, I think they can have that as a goal, but I think it's really important to know what's out there and what, what type of different, you know, programs are, are available. So NACAC is a, a national uh, college admissions. Um, it's just an organization that, that um, puts on each year, typically would be in person. Uh, usually it's in, in mid to late April in San Diego at the convention center, but obviously that's that's probably not gonna happen this year. So they've, they've moved it virtually. Um, they've got one for, there's a STEM fair on March 7th. They've got a visual performing arts one on the 16th. And then the Western US schools is April 10th from 12 to four. Um, and then you can, you can enroll at the virtualcollegefairs.org. And then College Board has something called Big Future Days. And, and they, what they've done is they've broken it into regional um, Areas So the West and the Southwest is February 6th, February 23rd are the Southeastern schools, March 7th is Northeast and March 11th is Midwest. So again, you can go onto that page and you can kind of see what's out there and see what, what schools are gonna be participating in that. Okay, so that was really kind of the bulk of the presentation. So talked a lot about four-year college and now we're gonna talk a little bit about the CRF process. So we call it the course request form process you'll hear it referred to as CRF. Normally they would obviously be getting this in person, they'd be getting a presentation in person, but this year they're beginning, they're going to get their packets um, online and then they're gonna get their presentation virtually. So really this is, I know it's, it's hard to believe we're at this point in the year, but um, this is the time where we start to talk about classes for next year. Um, students start to have those conversations with teachers and, and there's a process that, that filling out the form. So um, once we do our presentations, I think it's, it, it will be a good opportunity for you and for um, your student to, you know, obviously at, answer, ask us any questions. So what we normally do in, in a year that we'd be on person is we would offer in our um, staff lounge, we would offer an opportunity to come in, meet briefly for a few minutes with a counselor, um, not necessarily the counselor of, of your choice, but somebody who, who can help and kind of just walk through, you know, some of the questions you may have about some of the certain classes and how it plays in with their schedule next year. 
we're kind of doing the same thing, but again, it's gonna be virtual. So we're gonna have Zoom sessions. <clears throat> One's gonna be on February 22nd for parent to, parents to come in and we will we'll connect you with a counselor, preferably the one that would be, the, is your current counselor. Um, we might get help from other people, but we're gonna try to make it as personal as possible. Um, so that's for parents. So we wanna encourage you to attend that. Um, and then we have student drop-in sessions on Feb February 26th. That's um, a Friday. So we've tried, we've tried to link it with the asynchronous days so students aren't missing classes. And then March 5th. So um, we've got really three different times for the students, 8 to 10 on the 26th, 8 to 10 on March 5th, and also 1 to 3. And then a, a session for, for you as parents, uh, 1.30 to 4 p.m. And just, I just want to kind of remind everyone that <clears throat> We're, we're encouraging a four-year plan and we're encouraging you to, to have those conversations with your students. Um, I think if we had the opportunity to meet individually um, with every student, we would love to do that in, in their family. Um, but considering there's one of us for 500 plus stu students and families, it gets to be difficult. So I think it's important that if you can make it to the drop-in sessions that you do and, and, and we can you know, obviously give you as much help as we can provide. Course catalog. This is a really good resource for, for students and families. This just kind of goes through all the courses we offer and kind of the basic course description. So if you wanted to know the difference between, okay, my students considering high school English 3-4 versus honors humanities, you can kind of see, you know, these are the differences between the classes. And, and obviously this is a conversation you can have with us as counselors, but also with their current or former English teacher. Just an example of a transcript. So um, we'll get into the transcript um, opportunity to get the transcript because normally, again, I keep referring back to that. If we were in person, we'd be at the PAC, we would have handed you the transcript, which truthfully only has four or five grades on it, but it just gives you an idea as to what it looks like. Um, this is a that you know, example of a ninth grade transcript. Um, you can see the grades, you can see the, the, the little P on the left hand side of the, of the transcript that represents um, that it's a college prep class. So the only thing as you can see in this, in this um, example is that the ENS classes aren't college prep. Um, so PE, yes, it is a requirement to graduate. It is not a requirement for, for college. Uh, and then there's a graduation credit, graduation requirement credit summary. So there's a lot of zeros under the complete because this student hasn't completed a lot, but as that fills up, you'll, you'll start to see that the, the far right column, which says needed will be smaller and smaller. So again, just something to familiarize yourself with. And then obviously the, the GPA summary, which is, is important on, on the bottom left as well. This is an example of a student repeating a grade. So as you can see, there's a couple D grades um, one would be the English one. The other one is, is well, it's also a math Excel, but the, the high school English one is the one we want to highlight because a D in an English class would, be, would have to be repeated. So this example has a student taking, uh, repeating the D right away, turning it into a C. Um, the D will always be on the transcript. It's not just going to kind of go away. What will happen is the C will be reported into the GPA and the D won't be reported into the GPA. <clears throat> and then the next, um, the next slide is the, the D in biology one, which you can see at the very bottom was repeated in 10th grade uh, into a C. So again, that both of those classes will always stay on the, stay on the transcript, except the GPA will be replaced by the newer GPA. Okay, so just some strategies for school success. So, you know, as ninth graders, it, it, it's a, it typically can be a tough transition year. You know, I think this year is obviously nothing like it's been in the past. So I'm, I'm really hoping that students have, have been able to kind of figure out their way um, and, and, and realize that, you know, we as a school really try to pride ourselves and, and offer as much help as possible. Um, normally tutorial <clears throat> is on different days and at different times, but right now we've got it Tuesday through Thursday. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 2.20 to 3 o'clock. Um, we also have the what center, which is some it, it, in the past has been help for writing assignments, but it, it can also be for other things. Uh, that's also Tuesday through Thursday during tutorial. Um, and then we have Nighthawk tutoring uh, through Zoom Monday and Wednesday evening, 6.15 to 8.15. And then 
you know, those, those are really good opportunities for students to, you know, tutorial is a great opportunity for students to not only get help, but also connect with their teacher. But I would say the What Center and the, the Nighthawk Tutoring are, are things that have been a staple at, at Del Norte's, you know, ever since I worked here and have been really strong programs and opportunities for students to get help. Um, and then obviously checking Canvas once a week, you know, I'm sure students are doing that quite, quite more often than once a week, they're on it, you know, daily. Um, you know, using a planner, I think this is something for a lot of students that, that, you know, some students naturally are very organized, you know, they're, they like to check things off, they write things down, and then others aren't, you know, I think it, for some students, it takes a little bit of time to, to figure out their organizational system, and how is that going to, going to help them, you know, move forward. Um, but a planner is a really just even just a basic paper planner is something that that really can be beneficial for a lot of kids. Communicating with teachers via email, I think, you know, I always bring this example up for ninth graders, you know, and especially now because it's it's easy to just turn your screen on to, to black and not show up, you know, I think um, it's, it's, it's an easier thing to do, but I think as, as students mature and they start to realize you know, they have a little more control over their education, they want to connect with their teachers. And I think our teachers are exceptional when it comes to, to making those connections. You know, they are, you know, I think they're really struggling with the lack of the connection, just like we are as, as especially as counselors. Um, but I think really for a lot of students, the, the benefits not only to make that connection, just to have that human interaction, but I think from an academic standpoint, there's a huge advantage in, in when you connect and communicate with teachers. Um, obviously now most of that's email and sometimes through Zoom, um, but that's still a really, really important tool and, and a really way, good way to advocate for themselves. Um, obviously completing all assignments, preparing for tests, a little bit different now, but hopefully students are kind of getting into the swing of things now that we're you know, almost halfway through the year. And then, you know, as, as a counseling website, we, we really offer a lot of, a lot of different resource, resources as far as research and planning, you know, not, not only for the future, but also currently, and then connecting with us as counselors as well. Um, peer counseling, we, we have a, a really solid group of students that, that are, are, are hoping to, to continue to get more involved. We have uh, 42 students that are available for mentoring and social emotional support. So we, we had kind of turn this program, you know, into something a little bit more robust this year with the hope that we'd be able to use it. Um, we've been able to use it, but I think not to the extent that we could when we're in person, obviously, you know, it changes the game. But those kids are, are an amazing group of students that are, that are really, really dying to kind of meet with kids and help them, whether it's academic, mentoring, social, emotional support. And I know it's hard. I think it's hard for especially the younger students to to admit that they're they're struggling with with any of those things. So um, just understand that you know if, if if you don't maybe feel as comfortable with your counselor who you probably never met in person, um, you we do have some peer leaders that peer counselors that are really really good people that that are are are, are happy to connect. Um, we have a, a link to do that, and then we also have our our peer counseling advisor, Miss Hines. She she's somebody that you can connect with. Um, we're trying to do the social media thing. We've got two different platforms, DNHS Peer Counseling and, and DNHS underscore, underscore Student Services. So again, I think we're just really trying to meet students halfway and trying to provide as many opportunities to, to connect with not only us as counselors, but also our, our peer counselors as well. Um, and then also you can apply at some point. If that's something that you, you maybe are interested in, or you have a friend or a sibling or somebody that has done it. Um, we actually have an application that's out now. I think it's, I think it's actually due tomorrow, um, but every year we, we pull from a, a good group of leaders to, you know, to be peer counselors. What are my students' grades? So I'm sure most of you have probably figured it out by now, but um, checking Canvas is a good place to stay. I mean, most of the grades are, are still, we're gonna be done through Synergy. But I know Canvas sometimes has has updates on, on specific classes and as far as calendars go, um, and then checking to see if work is turned in. Um, report cards are, are typically mailed home at the end of each trimester. And then again, I think, you know, Del Norte does most, most years we have the parent-teacher conferences. I know it's a little bit not as formal this year as it's been in the past because of the circumstances, but Teachers are, are their email. I mean, <clears throat> we spend most of our day as counselors communicating with, with students and teachers and it's an email 
definitely not the preferred method of communication. I'd love to walk to a student or a teacher's class and say hello and, and connect, but you know, we're, we're just trying to make the best of it right now. So email is the preferred way. If you have any issues or if you have problems reaching out to teachers, uh, us as counselors are always available to, to help you as well. Counseling website, we really try to keep this updated, keep it robust, keep keep it some uh, a resource for students to, to check out. It's at the home page at the in, right in the beginning in the middle. As you can see, we've got many tabs there, so there's a lot of information. Um, hopefully, if, if it's something that you need, you can you can access it there. And then again, if if you have questions, we're we're always available to you know to connect to. Navion. So again, this is a unique um, year and a unique experience because normally we would have been able to get out student uh, our students connected to Navion. Again, if you have an, a sibling that that is older or has been through the the, the program here they would have had Naviant. Um, we really have used it for many years and, and found it to be the most useful tool out there in terms of preparing for the next step, whether it's whether it's college or career. Um, it, for us as counselors, it's also a communication tool. It's a way for us to communicate with people, um, but, it, but it's really the most beneficial thing I would say is for students and families as a resource. You know, it's really a, a, a very complex and comprehensive resource that you can build resumes, there's surveys on there, there's um, a ton of stuff when it comes to colleges, you know, the researching colleges, I mean, all of our historical data that, that we've kept since we've opened up here is, is on Navion. So it's, it's really, really the best tool when it comes to college admissions and, and starting that college application process. And then signing up for college visits when that normally, again, we would be having visits in our um, Nighthawk Center where students can come and meet with colleges and, and representatives from those colleges. Um, so again, it's a really, really good tool that, that we, you know, we, we encourage our students to, to use. This is kind of a, a longer piece, but you know, how to sign in, into Naviance. Um, there's there's an email connected to it. Um, if you have questions, you can always reach out to Mrs. Reich or Mrs. Stone to, to help set up the account. Um, again, this is passwords. You know, a lot of the times you're, you're having to, to put in the same type of thing. You really, all you really need is you need the, the, the registration code. Once you go in, um, you put in a, a, an email that you use and a password and then you're, you're good to go. So um, it's really important that that students um, continue to look and in, to use Naviance. Okay, so getting towards the end here, uh, tips for student success. So how many classes should my child take? That is kind of the, uh, the golden question, I think, for a lot of families. And, and the answer is there really is no answer. You know, I think there's no magic number where you say, oh, if you take 10 AP classes, you get into UCLA. I think if that were the case, everybody would be doing the same thing. I think the important thing to consider is, especially this year, is see where your child has 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 excelled, see where they maybe struggled, and see how they can maybe fit in an AP class if it's next year, or maybe it's further down the road, or maybe it's not at all. I think it really depends on it depends on the student. So a lot of times we get a lot of the same questions about AP classes and coursework. Um, and there's really no one answer, you know, it really depends on the student, depends on their strengths and weaknesses. So we really want to highlight that. Uh, stress caused by academic pressure. I mean, if there's a time to talk about it now in terms of balance, you know, it doesn't get much more important than now. I mean, I think it's hard enough just to live as it is right now, you know, as far as having things shut down and, and things are, are, are harder to access. But I think when, if, if students are able to find a balance now, um, as things start to reopen and schools start to open and we get back into a little bit more of a, a, a regular routine, um, I think that, you know, that the time that we spent kind of in quarantine and having to kind of figure life out with, you know, with a drop of a hat, I think it's important that, that those, that balance kind of translates from, from, you know, the, the, the pandemic life to the, you know, to the more, the, the more regular life. So I think it's important to, to keep that balance, to keep the, the, the basic things like walking outside, you know, stress management, time management. I think these are all things that are really, really important. And, and I think some students have probably accelerated their maturity and accelerated their growth when it comes to this. And, and others have 
have have also accelerated, but they found it to be you know harder than others. So again, I think it's important to to consider how the academics play into the overall balance of life, whether it's a you know friendships, sports, um, you know activities, you know all of those things are, are are just as important as academics, and I think it's important to remember that. Social media obviously is not going anywhere. If anything, it's getting more and more used. That you know, I think for a lot of kids, it can be something that's positive. I think there's a lot of opportunities out there. I think there's a lot of uh, really good resources out there. But then again, there's things that maybe aren't so good in terms of you know becoming addicted and and and, and posting things that maybe you shouldn't. So I think it's important that that students and families have that conversation and think. You know, I think we always go back to the same thing. If you think, should I post this or not? You probably shouldn't. So I think it's important to, to remember those things. Extra support. So again, we're here as counselors, grades, course load, choices, difficulty, um, questions about future, questions about college, career exploration, just needing someone to talk to. I know for me personally, um, this virtual thing has been really difficult because I, I, I can always speak for myself, but I know my other fellow counsel counselors are going through the same thing. It's, you know, I really thrive off of interacting with my students and being, you know, making those connections and not having that has made it um, has made it challenging. It's made it difficult, but um, I think it's important to know that you know we're here and, and we, we want to you know work with your with your student. And then we have Miss Hines. She's normally in G one eighteen. You know, when we get back on campus, that's where she'll be located. She helps with volunteer opportunities. She runs the peer counseling program, crisis intervention, stress and wellness, grief and loss tobacco, vaping, alcohol, and drug resources. So we really try to do our best to support uh, all of our students. Okay, so just a couple things to remember. I know I, I spoke a lot and I, I, I talked about really everything that high school has to offer, but we are offering transcript pickup for, for students who want to see their transcript and they want to use their transcript to, to help them choose classes for next year. Um, we're doing it by alpha. So A through G is February 10th. H through O is February 11th, P through Z is February 12th, and it's all 1.30 to 3.30. We're gonna set up a drive-through where we're able to kind of hand out transcripts and uh, get you on your way, you know, as contact-free as possible. And then um, the drop-in sessions, like I mentioned, February 22nd, 1.30 to 4. Um, that will be Zoom. We will send out the, that link. And then the student ones are February 26th and March 5th. February 26th, 8 to 10 a.m., March 5th, 8 to 10 a.m., and then an additional one in the afternoon, one to three. All right, so I am gonna conclude. Um, I am going to stop the, rec the recording and then we can answer some questions um, as a group here, so. So one of the questions, Mr. Rohde, was about parent view and student view. Um, families are no longer able to view the course history. When will they appear again? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have the answer to that. That's a, that's more of a, um, a district thing. I think that's kind of the reason we're trying to get the transcript out to you. So for a lot of students who can't see their, their course history, and it's not as, it's not as, I think, urgent as ninth graders, but I think for the, for the older students, that's, that's why we're trying to get the transcript out. To answer the question, I, do, I don't have the answer. I don't know if that's going to change. I know that was a something that was kind of changed this year. Um, our, our, our IT department did that, so I, I don't know if it's going to go back or not. Thank you. Another question that the families were asking in the chat um, was regarding volunteer hours. Are there requirements for graduation? No, I, I had addressed that in the presentation. There, there is no requirement. Um, no, you could. We could have every student at our high school never do volunteer hours and, and graduate. So it is not a requirement. However, if it's something a student is interested in and something that they, they, they're passionate about, we would, we would recommend that they do that. Whether it's one hour or a thousand hours, it doesn't matter. Um, but I think um, it would be something to consider if, they're, you know, if they, they want to take that opportunity to do that. Another question was regarding honor courses. Do the honor courses at Dale and Orte count, count as advanced placement? No, they don't. They, they aren't weighted grades. Um, they, they are more, 
they are more for acceleration purposes and preparation purposes than they are for GPA purposes. But we do offer two classes um, under the Career Technical Education Honors Principles of Engineering and Honors Medical Intervention, which yeah. are rated in a 5.0 scale. That's true. Those are the only two non-AP classes that are given a weighted grade. So the Honors Principles of Engineering and the Medical Interventions. Another question that I have from the chat is regarding uh, language requirement. Does Power USD require a language requirement? No, um, it is not required. A student could, could conceivably not take a language and still graduate. Four-year college is a, is a different question, but yeah not a requirement for graduation. Another question is regarding middle school. If a student took integrated math 1A, 1A and B and 2A, 2B, do they count towards high school graduation? No, they don't count towards graduation, but they will be in play when it goes to applying to a four-year college as far as meeting that requirement. Um, it's not going to be a class you receive credit or a grade for on the transcript, but it will be something that you will need to report um, when you apply for certain colleges. Another question is regarding uh, community college. Can you take community college classes for high school credit? Yes, we have everything that, that is done through community college goes through our registrar. We have a handful of classes that are approved um, and you have to get pre-approval to you know, attend those classes and potentially get it on your transcript if it's approved by the district. So um, the answer is yes, it's just not, not every class. What does CT stand for? Career Technical Education. Ms. Kinneman or Ms. Marin, will you be able to ask Mr. Rodi some questions? Uh, yes, I think we've covered most of them. Um, Mrs. I've been watching the chats and um, answering many of them. I think we've covered most everything. Uh, Ms. Marin, Kathy, do you see anything that I have missed? Mm, no, I don't think so. There was one question about um, taking languages that are not offered at the high school and could they count? Um, and that's a tricky question. Um, especially now that the SATs are not um, offering the subject exams anymore. Um, you just have to make sure that the courses are A through G approved in order to utilize them on the um, UC or CSU applications and have them count towards meeting the admissions requirements. Um, certainly students can take uh, you see approved courses at the community college as well. Um, you can also check with our registrar to see if there are courses that can be put on the high school transcript. There are some um, outside language um, schools that are approved to be put onto the Del Norte high school transcript. Um, and you would just need to work through uh, our registrar, Mrs. Molly Molly and she would be able to help if you have questions that are specific to which courses um, would be able to be um, placed on the high school transcript. There was a question about, is one year of any subject equal to three trimesters? Do you wanna share that, Tim, or um, just that some of our courses are two trimesters and then oh. our AP are three trimesters? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, most most classes are, um, you know, two trimesters except for the AP classes. The AP classes go three trimesters and then, you know, English, history, 
um, science, you're usually typically English one, two, world history one, two, you know, biology of the living earth one, two. Um, so yeah, most, most of our, our classes are one, twos, and then the APs are, are all year long. So it could be a first and second trimester you take an English class, or it could be first and third, or it could be second and third. So it's not necessarily all year round, whereas an AP class is always first, second, and third trimester. Um, another question was, uh, when does enrollment for next year start? Um, and I had put in the chat that we will be, um, the counselors will be in all of the ENS classrooms on February 4th, uh, virtually spending the class period with the students going over the whole CRF process. And that that day, the course request form and other resources will be um, posted in Canvas and also on our counseling website. So the students will have the 60 minute period with the counselor in their classroom setting in the ENS classroom, where we go over a PowerPoint and go through this process in more detail with them. And then they can see the CRF and the other resources. There'll be some math and science um, charts, that kind of thing posted on Canvas and our counseling website. So there is a lot more coming and it will be basically February 4th is when that will be starting. Um, there is a question about are all, eighth, are all three trimesters of an AP class on a five point scale? Do you wanna take that, Tim? Yeah. Um, yes. The, the, the only thing that I think you have to consider is that so the, the AP classes are all, they're three trimesters, but they're only weighted for two. So for example, um, I don't know, AP calculus, the, the first two trimesters are weighted and the third trimester is, is pre-calc, it, it's not weighted. So um, you, you'll be able to see that um, on the CRF and it's also would be on the transcript or even the the course catalog, but um, yeah, to answer the question is two of the three trimesters are, are weighted. Um, there's a question, um, Mr. Rohde. Yeah. Do you have to take the full year of an AP course? Do you have to take all three trimesters of an AP course? Yeah. The answer is yes. I mean, there are circumstances where a student doesn't, but um, that's, you know, case by case. And the idea is to take it all three. Uh, there's a question. If you have no electives this year, should you reconsider your course load? Um, that would include the student having ENS, uh, each trimester. So there's one class that is maybe less rigorous academically, but then it sounds like the student had four academic classes with, along with the ENS class, which does have a health component. Um, and I think that would depend on how the student felt with that load. So we always um, encourage families and students to think about how do they feel with the load they chose? And if it's gone well, um, then they can keep up that same kind of rigor the next year or possibly add a little more rigor if it went well and seemed very manageable. So, um, but we, we also don't want our students to get overwhelmed. And a lot of times our ninth grade students going into 10th feel like they have to take on a very um, rigorous load and and we don't want them to overdo it. So it really is um, balance and being careful not to take on too much and to always factor in the other extracurricular and athletics that you have going on in your, in your days and make sure that you can really manage the load that you're gonna be selecting. Um, there is a question that's come up a couple times um, about math in middle school. And I believe the question is, if they take 1A, integrated 1A, 1B, or integrated 2A, 2B in middle school, 
does it count to toward graduation from high school? Um, so Tim, maybe do you want to take that one? Um, it just yeah. about math in middle school and does it count toward high school graduation and, and how does it apply toward college admissions? Yeah, I answered that earlier, but it basically is, um, it doesn't count for credit. You don't get credit for the class for high school, but when you go to apply to a four-year college, um, it will be something that is asked to report your your middle school math uh, or potentially language classes and grades. So um, not credit, but um, is something that is is something that you'll you'll need to report at some point um, if you apply to uh, most four year colleges. And there's a question. There is a cap of eight trimester AP classes. That means only four AP courses will be counted as five points. Um, and that is in reference to the UC application. Um, keep in mind that all AP classes for graduation count as part of the GPA. Um, the UCs limit the eight trimesters or equivalent to eight semesters as part of their um, entrance uh, with the GPA. Um, but it also varies campus by campus. So we do recommend that families don't get too tied up about that point because it has to do with how the UCs evaluate, not how everybody evaluates. Um, and also keep in mind that AP courses in the ninth grade and that ninth grade grades for the UC and the Cal State are not inclusive in the um, admissions GPA, but they are included in graduation GPA in all other colleges. It looks like somebody has their hand raised. I'm gonna... Um, while you're doing that, there's another question about taking more math, and this has come up several times also. Um, if a student has taken math in middle school, the credits do not go on the high school transcript. Um, students have to, whatever point they start in ninth grade, so if they're in 2A, 2B, they still have to take 20 more credits. If they're in 3A, 3B, they still have to take 20 credits. Um, we do recommend that students stay in math all four years. Some students will cap out, meaning they're done by the time, in other words, they get all the way through BC and AP stats. They, they are eligible to take college level classes at that point. Um, so it really just depends on the individual student. Our students are at all different levels in math throughout high school. Um, it is recommended that they go up to through 3A, 3B for a four-year college, and some colleges require a fourth year. Um, and so it really just, the answer to that question is it depends. 20 credits are required to graduate up through 3A, 3B is minimum for a college for four-year colleges. Yeah, I would also say we, we typically recommend taking it as, as far as you can and, and really regardless of where a student goes to college because a lot of times um, if they can complete more in high school, obviously for free, um, they'll be far better prepared to wherever their next step is. And, and if it's a community college, um, hopefully they can start at uh, co taking college level classes. So that'll make the transfer process quicker. And also you'll have to you'll be paying for less classes essentially. So yeah, idea is, is at least through 3B and if, if potentially another a fourth year would be, would be ideal. Um, there's a question about AP classes and how they're evaluated by the UCs, the ones with the highest grades. Um, keep in mind, it's not about the grade, it's about the extra point value. So it's not about which grade or which grades are the highest. It has to do with adding the extra points. Yeah, there's a calculator if you if you're curious to know how it's done.
think that's it. I think we've covered about everything. Cool. All right, well, thank you for your time. Hopefully we were able to answer all of the questions. If not, um, you know, we, we are available to, to answer questions, but I think, again, I would just emphasize for CRF process, uh, procedure for next year is, is attend the, um, the drop-ins and then, you know, hopefully you will be able to get all your questions answered. And then obviously the students have an opportunity to, to, to connect with us during the drop-ins as well. So hopefully you all had a good evening and um, we'll meet each other at some point down the road. Mm -hmm.